We're talking combat sports on this week's show. Sade El Nahas, an Olympic bound judokan, and Anthony Corelli. WWE fans will remember him as Santino Morella. Joe Tilly Sports, coming up. Welcome to the program. We've got two amazing guests for you here today. First of all, let me introduce to you. He was born in Alexandria, Egypt, immigrated to Canada at 12 years old. The 2018 Osaka Grand Slam silver medalist, a Grand Slam bronze medalist in 2019, Zagreb Grand Prix gold medalist in 2019, two-time Pan American champion, the 2020 Hungary Grand Slam bronze medalist, Tilibus Grand Slam gold medalist in 2021. He has qualified for the Tokyo Olympics, ranked seventh in the world, Montreal judoka, Shady El Nahas. Welcome to the program, Shady. And Anthony Corelli, 36 years in judo, 30 plus years black belt, five-time junior nationalist medalist, former junior national champion, junior world's team member, judo coach from 2016 to 2020 at his Battle Arts Academy in Mississauga, first ever Judo Canada ambassador, 10-year veteran of the WWE, former Intercontinental U.S. and Tag Team Champion from Mississauga. We bring you Anthony Corelli. Anthony, Shady, good to see you. Thank you so oh, much. Great to be us. here, guys. Thanks for being in the program. Now, Shady, you're on your way to uh, Tokyo. It looks like we're still go we're still to go for the for the uh, 2020 Olympics, which are happening in 2021. Uh, competing at uh, under 100 kilos. Only 23 years old. You know, we just talked about your resume. It's a very impressive one. Tell us, uh, first of all, how you, wh why your family made the decision to come to Canada and then how you got into judo. Honestly, well, originally we moved uh, to, to Canada for a better life, educational-wise. And just uh, the way of life. Uh, yeah, so after that, I went back to doing judo seriously because in egypt i wasn't taking it that serious and then i don't know why but once i moved to canada i fell in love with it and uh yeah in 2012 that's when i moved i did the nationals and i won it surprisingly and yeah since then i was like okay i'm actually decently good enough to pursue this as a career right and i understand your your brother mohab also uh, paved the way for you to a degree in judo Un 100%. Honestly, I just followed his footsteps when we were in Egypt to do the sport and, and in, uh, also in Canada. And yeah, every time if you see me when I fight and, and Mohab's in the same tournament, I look at him. I listen more to him than anybody else on the mats because I think he knows my style since he's been my training partner for all my life. Is this, uh, like when you say he's your most, uh, well, he's the guy you've trained with your entire life. Is, was he your inspiration? Is he the guy you sort of looked up to? Is he would he would you call him your uh, sort of your hero of the sport? Hundred percent. Because also when uh, when uh, we first started out, Mohab was super amazing at it, and of course I wasn't that great. And uh, yeah, honestly, I was also a right-sided fighter, and fighting Mohab made me switch left because he would always beat me up. So of course I always looked up to him <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be the judoka I am. A lefty judoka, also, if it wasn't for him. So, but you started out as a righty. Now you're a lefty. A little bit of a transition there, but it's worked out well for you. Tell us about the road to Tokyo and 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 what you went through to get yourself in this position. Uh, honestly, it was probably one of the roughest experiences I've had to go through. Honestly, because. Uh, Going on the road, uh, on the year 2019, I took 49 planes for, of, to compete. And then the pandemic happened, and I couldn't uh, compete for a year. So it was a, a weird transition. But, uh, yeah, it's a, rough, it's a rough time because you always want to win. But that's almost close to impossible if you have to compete every single month. But, uh, honestly, it's, 
it gave it gave me the opportunity to travel the world, and uh, I wouldn't have changed anything about it. Even if I lost, even if I won won this competition, it was it was an experience I don't think a lot of people go through. So I'm very grateful for that. Anthony, you want to chime in here? Yeah, man. There's so I'm a big fan of Shadi, and and actually, so I did judo my whole life, right through university, and then of course we pursued professional wrestling but judo is always my my identity growing up um it was my passion it was really my first love and anytime i had an opportunity one time there was a, a junior national championships in uh, toronto and there was a training camp at one of the hotels and I, I went down just to say hi to some of my old roommates and stuff that are now coaches and they're former olympic athletes and actually that was the first time i saw shadi his brother and his cousin and they were gosh 15 16 um and you can see that that was the next generation. They were up and coming, and, and they were, they just reminded me a lot of myself um, when I, because I was, you know, 15, 16, 17, running around tournaments, and, and we were the young group. And um, it was, and then years later, I showed up at the Ontario Open just as a spectator and getting the scoop on, you know, what's happening. And people are like, yeah, those two brothers, they are the best in, in Canada. Nobody can touch them. So I start paying attention. And then I'm watching just the results. Now, now Shad is 23 years old. And if you look at some of the results he had, he, he's 19, 20 years old fighting in his division. And he's very humble, as you can see. But, you know, he's, he's really good. Um, he's fighting guys like they're 30 years old. And he's in the 220-pound category. So some of the lighter weight categories, they can be, you know, 18-year-olds and, and because they're 150 pounds. But then as they get that muscle maturity, they're going to move up categories. So the guys that are in his category, they're men. They're full-grown men, and they're cutting down from 240 pounds, and they're cutting down to – and, and he's not cutting any weight, and he's thin for the division, and he's young, and he's smashing these guys. And, of, co of course, as an athlete, you never want to lose. But, but you, when you're a 30-year-old veteran and you see this 20-year-old kid in front of you, you definitely don't want to lose, especially when you saw what he did. He has a couple of throws of the year, like super highlight throws. He did one in Montreal. It was an incredible Epon, and uh, the crowd went nuts. And uh, it was – here's another one. Look at this. Boop, rolls through. He's just he's, – his, his character, him and his brother, they're both – they really have that dichotomy that you want to see in an athlete. They're, they're respectful and they're educated and they come from a good family and they understand the work ethic involved. And then they go on the mats and they're animals and they have no problem slamming you on your head if you don't tuck at your chin, you know. And it's what athletes are supposed to be. They understand the value of education, the work ethic. They're excellent representatives. They're role models. Somehow in Canada, we got to figure out a way to make amateur athletes just – Put them in the spotlight. Show, it's not just about hitting home runs and slam dunks. You know, It's about the work ethic. And look at what he said. He had a chance to travel the world. My, my junior worlds was actually in Egypt. And, uh, and it was incredible. It was just an incredible experience. I went to Japan when I was 18, representing Canada. And, I, you know, here I am, a kid from Mississauga, going to Japan. It's mind-blowing that you're getting on a plane and you're going to represent your, your country in international competition. Um, Representing your country should should be a dream for every young kid out there that wants to pursue sports. You know, it, it's huge. And judo is a fantastic sport. Of course, we're biased because we, we do judo. But mm -hmm. self-defense, the, the physical attributes you're going to gain, the confidence, the respect, um, it's, it's an incredible sport. It's, it's a huge sport. I think it's number two in the world with regards to country participation. Um, you know, I forget what it is, 125 to 150 countries participate. So when it's a world judo tour, it's a legitimate world judo tour. It's not just, you know, cross-country skiing where the only the, you know, cold countries can do it. This is a completely international sport. And when you are a world champion, you are a real world champion. Uh, it's, it's just the, the world judo tour right now, the IJF is doing a fantastic job of putting on these events in stadiums and arenas all over the world. And the quality of the events is, is uh, it's consistent. It's very professional. Um, you can log on at, you know, IJF.org or EPON.org and watch the competitions live. The amount of information on the website 
when you click fighters and you can see their fights from previous tournaments, their results, it's, it's really, really professionally run. And I was fortunate enough to be a guest at some international competitions. Um, then I did some guest commentary, but because I've been doing some commentary in professional wrestling, they thought I was incredible, but it was kind of cheating. You know, I've been doing it and uh, I was invited back to do some, uh, some commentary. Um, I actually was doing commentary when, when Shadi did the, the big throw in Montreal. And uh, I don't know if I, you know, I'm probably not to be supposed to be biased, but I was like doing it like uh, professional wrestling, like, oh my God, what a smash. And then, you know, trying to bring it to life the best I could. But yeah, the, what they're doing is incredible. So he's 23 years old and the next Olympics are in three years. And this is what, this is one of the right. questions I, I had for Shadi myself. At 100 kilograms, 220 pounds, a lot of people believe that your physical peak, you know, people thought it was younger before, at 24 years old, but now it's like 29, 30 years old. So you have an opportunity to go to three Olympics. Would you consider going to the Olympics at 30 years old? Honestly, yeah, because uh, my teammate, Antoine, is he just, he just turned 30 and he's, he's going for his third. And... Uh... Yeah, he, he's an Olympic medalist, so of course I would. Uh, also, it also depends on how I do on the Olympics. So, my goal is to at least do two, and if my body is holding up, I'll I'll definitely try to go for a third. Keith Morgan, well, my uh, old roommate, he went to four. Yeah. Right. Let's yeah. talk about let's talk about your three or four. That's that's a lot. I, you know, I know where there's some some guys who I I, I used. To, my my previous stop before Toronto was Lethbridge, and I actually did a half hour documentary uh, on the Lethbridge judo team back when I was there. This is a long time ago. This is nineteen eighty four. But uh, strong, strong team. I don't know if you guys ever. Uh, Joe Melly was the guy who sticks out for me. I don't know yeah. if you know that familiar with that name or not. But but uh, he was strong. But there were there were a number of people, a number of judokans from uh, judokans from Lethbridge that had gone to the Olympics numerous times, and and. Uh, it was uh, it was pretty cool, big sport. And uh, now, who would you say, Shadi, is is your number one nemesis right now? Who are the guys that you think you the two are that maybe one or two guys that you know you're gonna have to beat in order to get to the podium in, in Tokyo? Uh, for me, also, I honestly believe I can beat anybody except. Well, I can believe I can beat them, but my Except. hardest challenges will be yeah, no, yeah. My hardest challenges will probably be the the Japanese wolf and uh, oh yeah, Le Partigliani, the Georgian, which I never yeah, fought. I never fought Georgian, and uh, one of the Russians, I think, will be my. Is that the guy you just three. fought, the Russian guy? Uh, yeah, yeah, but I don't know if they're gonna yeah, take I... him or the other one. So we'll see. Yeah, it very depends on the draw, field. right? It's always uh, yeah. yeah. That's why I wanted to get seated in the top eight and stay seated in the top eight to, to have the, the better draw. So, right, yeah, and you did Japanese that. That's fighter awesome. right now called Aaron Wolf, and Aaron, Wolf, which is yeah. not traditionally a Japanese name, but he, no, he's no. Uh, I believe he's he's world champion right now. But also, Shadi beat has beaten in the past the current world champion, uh, George Fonseca from uh, Portugal. So I mean. That has to be a confidence booster, you knowing that you have what it takes to beat the guy who's the current world champion. Right. 100%. And, and, 100%. I beat him. Yeah. yeah no, sorry. Him sorry continue on. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I beat George Fonseca twice, and uh, that was before he became world champion, but also it's like a, it's a mental thing. It's like, yeah, I can beat a, a current world champion. I've beaten... Haga, which was a, who was a war champion, he was like a guy I looked up to as a kid. So those are all mental, like it helps me mentally to believe in myself. Let's talk about what you, how the, how the, how you've been affected by the pandemic. I mean, you know, uh, you know, we, we like to say when, you know, when the world gives us lemons, we make lemonade. Have you made, have you been able to make the most of this? Have you put yourself in a position where you've grown, you've grown in strength and gotten yourself better? More than anything, it was more a mental challenge for me because uh, for around nine, 10 months, I couldn't train at all, really judo. So it was rough to try to stay in shape because I always believed I needed a little tick to, to, to reach the level I want to reach, which was to be the best in the world. So that was rough. And also now we train four people in a group. Not We can't all interact, all the athletes together. 
so it's very limited the way we train but it's we we try to make the best out of it of course uh but unlike other countries outside they're all able to train together and like the uzbeks never did never corona never existed there so it was it was a, it was a different environment of course and in canada there's not a lot of heavy guys for me to, to, to fight with so it's very limited but again i try to to, to find the best uh, solution and uh yeah that's why I, I think i fight a little bit like a lightweight because i fight a lot of lighter guys but uh yeah again i'm trying to make lemonade you know right exactly tell us about ken fukushima your your coach uh, have you been able to have lots of contact with him and and uh uh, yeah, me, me and uh, Sensei Ken, we talk every day, basically, till, till now. And uh, before the pandemic, we'd always go for dinner after a tournament and like try to discuss everything that happened. And uh, he became more of like a, like a father figure, like a second father for me. And uh, he brought me in when I didn't want to do judo. And he made, showed me what was so special about the sport that I forgot. Because after getting thrown, and you kind of sometimes want to be like, oh, I want to break. But he showed me why the sport is amazing and uh, i'm very grateful that he showed me that because that's it took me to to where i am now right takes you deeper i've heard a, i heard a uh, uh, quote recently was like uh, there's no such thing as losing there's only winning and learning right and if you can look at if you can take that that uh uh you know that attitude into all of your competitions and you know you're just always learning and always learning and you're just a young guy so you know to to have accomplished what you've accomplished already i mean i, I gotta think that the, there's gonna be some guys who are who are in for a bit of a surprise i know styles make fights too right it's the same as boxing and 100%. you know you mean you mean you there might be a guy who nobody can beat but you can beat him every time right that's kind of the way it happens in, 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 in combat sports like that so uh how's your confidence level heading to tokyo Honestly, I, I I I truly believe I can I can win the gold. That that's been a goal of mine, and uh, the closer it gets, I think the better I'm getting. Because honestly, if you asked me that question last year, I would have been iffy. But this year, I put on a lot of weight, I put on a lot of muscle, I put on a lot of like I improved a lot of stuff in my in my arsenal, and I believe I can get the job done. Putting on the muscle without losing any agility, without losing any speed, it's all there. Because that's why I hear about you too. Is that you're you're fast, you guys quick, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got some amazing throws, and your guy that, that has a tremendous work ethic, and, and that, that that's serving you very well, right? Thanks. Deceptively yeah, strong honestly, too. Yeah, go ahead, Anthony. Yeah. Oh, I'm just saying when you see his stature, these guys are like. In the beginning, when I first saw him in the international competition, I'm like, damn, he looks kind of smaller than the other guys a little bit. But then he slams them. And I mean, judo is like, okay, obviously, judo, you can win and you can lose. But when you lose, there's the potential to be like this, you know, horrific body slam right in center of the center of the arena. And everyone's going to see it. And that's the risk, one of the risks of the sport. Um, so there's a lot of athletes that could, that could win. Uh, the gold medal if they have the most incredible day of their life. But Shadi doesn't need the most incredible day of his life. He just needs to be on that day just to be, you know, as good as he can be. He doesn't need any luck. He doesn't need, um, you know, people to make mistakes. He just needs to be up to par for him. And that that's a, a huge confidence booster, I think, because he's not he's not praying for a miracle. He just wants to be able to perform the way he can. Right. Yeah. Honestly, for so me, how do you want to finish your the, thought? The, yeah. The, yeah. The, the my only worry when I go into tournament, the only stress I have is not fighting to my potential. It's not oh this guy's strong, I I can't lose to him. It's never never like that. It's always like I just hope today is like well not today. I hope I just perform to my abilities because I believe if if that just happens, I can win the whole tournament. You know, it's never, oh, I'm, this guy's strong. I'm scared of this guy. And I think that's a big part of uh, any judoka who wants to, to perform. You can't just think about the other opponents. You got to implement your style, your judo, and see what happens, right? You can't just overthink it. Right. And there's don't, the, I, I'm really, I'm the only thing that's going to stop you is maybe like that particular day you, you're sick, 
right or something like that could could happen but i mean you you know what you're you're capable of you know what your abilities are you know that you can beat these guys and and so it's just a case of of executing i want to talk a little bit about your your uh, i mean you've had a chance to travel all over the world with judo and you've had some uh, you know, what just what are your favorite spots to travel to and and uh, can you give us your favorite competition to this point uh, Maybe it had something to do with the result, but maybe it didn't. Maybe it was just a, an amazing experience for you. Yeah, uh, honestly, Japan is uh, gonna be one in like top three countries I've ever been in. Uh, the food's amazing. The people are very respectful. The streets are clean. It was, it was when I first went there. It was something I never experienced in any other country. The way they live, and it was something I uh, I took that back home with me. I was like, wow, that's that's impressive how they live that way uh but also i like when we go to tropical places like uh for when i went to portugal during the summer it was really good that was a few years back uh but yeah honestly i don't think a country because also i'm a judoka so when you go to japan it's like wow that's that's where it all started so it kind of mm -hmm. hits home more than any other country you've been in so i'm um, i think that the olympics happening in japan is uh it's such a big deal to me because I feel like it's it's uh, it's the Olympics where uh, nothing can compare to that Olympics. You know, for for the sport of judo because it's it's at yeah. it's at home. You know, it's a homecoming, right? And it'll be like yeah, so that, like judo is Japan's sport, right? And so this is kind of like uh, the highlight event in 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 the country where it all originated from, and and you know the the hub of judo in the world. So the, the games are scheduled to start uh, July 23rd. You've had a, a great year. Wouldn't it be nice to cap it with a gold medal in Tokyo? Uh, this is going to be, though, a, a games like no other we've ever seen, like none that we've ever seen. Uh, what do you know about uh, competing? I understand that, like, you're going to have to wear a mask the whole time you're there unless you're competing. I heard that uh, you're going to have to leave uh, Tokyo 48 hours or less after you finish com competing. Uh, you won't be able to go into the athlete's village. You won't be able to go anywhere outside of the athlete's village. Uh, it, it's going to be really strange. What are your thoughts heading into that? Are, are, how do you feeling about that? Honestly, I'm a, I'm a very easygoing guy, so I'm kind of I like to go with the flow. And honestly, like yeah, I've, uh, I dreamt about the opening ceremony and all of the Olympic experience. But more than anything, I dreamt about winning the gold medal. So. Honestly, I don't really care if I can't do all the Olympic experience. Maybe I'll do that the next, the following one if I qualify again. But what matters to me is uh, going to the Olympics and winning the gold medal at the Olympics. You know, it's uh, it's all of around its distractions. I think after a while. So if I'm there, of course, I want to experience the whole thing. But at the same time, I'm just happy if I end up with a medal at the games. What uh, uh, you you've been traveling? I mentioned earlier you traveled all around the world. Give us a have you got any like crazy travel experiences? Experience where where things you really went awry or? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I, I honestly like I'm I'm for somebody that travels a lot. I hate 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 traveling. I hate being in an airport. Uh, it's just because there's always something happening. You know, it's like when we went to China. I had we went to the airport. Then when we had to go from China to uh, Mongolia, and it took it took us like five days to get there because we had to go there. Then midway in the area, we had to grab, like fly back because there was too much turbulence. And whenever turbulence happen, I freak out because uh, <laughs> I'm a very annoyed guy when it comes to flying. Mm -hmm. So it's just it's once we get to the the country, like when one once we're on the floor and outside of the airport, I'm good. I love to travel, but other than that, I hate 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 traveling. Let's talk about uh, the. Uh, uh, let's bring you back, uh, Anthony. I want to tell, talk a little bit about your your experiences in traveling and some of your experiences uh, uh, outside of judo. Uh, you're you're a former WWE star, uh, Santino Morella, and uh, <laughs> uh, tell us about that experience and, and, and how that happened. And, and uh, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's funny because uh, I started pro wrestling late. Because of because of judo, you know, I went to and plus I went to, you know, university, teachers college, and all that kind of stuff. So by the time I'm done, a lot of people are well into their career. So I kind of started my training at 28 years old, 
uh, my first match at 29. I lived in Japan for like, you know, the year that I was 30. Um, and then I moved to Louisville, Kentucky for and when I was 31 to learn that WWE style. And then uh, got signed at 32 and debuted at 33. And uh, yeah, it was kind of a whirlwind. But the reason I was able to move you know, through the ranks so quickly was because I had that judo background and I wasn't afraid to fall and I knew how to grapple and I was comfortable on the ground and standing and it completely helped me. And when I went to Japan, because judo is from Japan, it kind of, and I was coming there as this, you know, former Canadian judo champion guy and it kind of elevated me and, and, and gave me a little bit of a boost in terms of the opportunities in Japan. And then when I came back to North America, um, I had, because I had come from Japan in my pro wrestling travels, it kind of, again, gave me that little bit of a, a boost and, uh, you know, pushed me up a level. So they were kind of feeding off each other, which was really helpful because I didn't have a lot of time to waste. Um, but yeah, travel, gosh, we traveled. Um, we were on the road about what well, for several years, about uh, 300 days a year. So it was wow. five days a week on the road, home for two days. But one of those two days is a travel day. So you're home for an hour and a half. And then at least one weekend per month, you're overseas doing something. So, you know, you're home for, you know, five days per month. So it, it, it was pretty grueling. You know, you, you have to learn how to live out of a suitcase. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. We had a, apparently a power, power function at the junction. Shadi, welcome back. So, uh, uh, we, we, we were listening to uh, Anthony talk about some of his, his uh, wrestling exploits. Um, you know, you, you mentioned you, you're not crazy about travel. Uh, you, uh, but it, I guess it's a, a, an unnecessary evil part of, the, part of the sport. You guys get a chance to travel a lot, you know, like, uh, so judo must have some, some decent funding for, uh, for travel. Being in the top eight helps me, helped me get funded fully for uh, every trip I've been on so far. Uh, but for example, for my brother, who was still trying to qualify, he, he had to pay every single penny out of his pocket. So it also depends on your circumstances, right? If uh, I'm, I'm very lucky and blessed that I get to, to be funded. But for example, my brother he had to, to, to pay out of his own pocket for everything. So for every athlete, it's a different experience. It's a different circumstance because, for example, for my brother, he paid everything, so he feels the pressure and he needs to perform. And for me, of course, I'm blessed to be funded, so it's a different situation. But, uh, yeah, overall, I, uh, I think the funding is good. Can it be better? Maybe. For right. every athlete that tries to go to the Olympics. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, honestly, like um, uh, for me, I'm uh, I'm blessed, so I have no complaints. So I'm 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 happy with uh, with the funding I'm receiving. What about uh, is Mo Mohab is heading to Tokyo as well? Is he qualified as well? He's in the process of uh, qualifying right now. He's supposed to do the Pan Ams, and uh, after that, maybe Worlds. But uh, uh, a lot of uh, Pan Ams got canceled for most Canadians uh, because to due to, to COVID reasons. Uh, so hopefully he can uh, try to do uh, last two tournaments and uh, make his way into the, the, the qualifications. Um, anything it, that, uh, sorry, is there somebody? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's I'm me. Sorry. I'm back. Okay. Hi, Anthony. Yeah, welcome. Back yeah, yeah. Welcome back. So I had to no, turn we're just, my, uh, we're just, uh, uh, I plugged it in. We were just uh, t talking about the funding for Judo Canada and talk about uh, Mohab uh, trying to qualify as well. And it looks like he, he could st he could still do that as well. And, and we, we, we should look yeah. at that. Mohab uh, we're, is in we're a in tough division yeah. as well. Sorry, right. he's in a tough division. There's uh, several guys that, you know, are, are on the international circuit in that particular division. Um, it's, it's, it's a tough race in that category. You know, Shadi kind of owns... Well, there's Kyle Reese in Shadi's division as well, but but Shadi's the guy who owns that division right now. But in minus ninety kilos, where his brother is, that's, there's a there's a tough race going on there. Now, tell us a little more about the about the the, uh, the team, uh, Anthony. Tell us who, who what other uh, Canadians can we watch out for? Oh man, well the girls are are um, well. There's actually Arthur Margelidon. 
and I was a big fan of his judo as well. He just won a medal. He got a silver medal. Shadi in uh, in uh, was a Croatia. In Tbilisi, in Tbilisi, Tbilisi he just yeah. got a silver and he got a bronze the week after in Turkey. Yeah, and Catherine. Right. Uh, oh, you have to help me with her last name. Bo Bosh Bo uh, Pinar. <laughs> Boshman Pinar. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. I got it. She she just she's also <laughs> you know getting a lot of medals online. But Canada has a very interesting situation right now in fifty seven kilograms, where we have like the top two girls in the world this never happened before in canada where the top two competitors in the world are from the same country and unfortunately only one girl is going to get to go to the olympics and that's just devastating is nobody i mean except for example let's say both of them went to the olympics they could meet in the finals and and uh, you know it, the fact that someone that's medal worthy is not going to go. That seems like it's it's just something wrong is happening when, when someone who could, guy, you know, you know, you know, what I'm trying to say that someone, mm -hmm. that the caliber of getting a medal is going to stay home. That's that seems wrong to me somehow, but uh, you know, it's the way it happens. But only one representative per country, which is unfortunate when you've got the one and two in the world from the same country. That it doesn't make sense because really, don't you want the best competition? You want the best competition at the game, so it only makes sense that you'd have the, the best people there. Anybody else in Canada, Shadi, that you can think of that sticks out for you? Well, of course, Antoine, because he's uh, he already yes. medaled at the, the 2012 uh, London Olympics, and uh, he has the most experience out of everybody fighting the elite. And he's been consistent and in the top ten for a long, long, long time. So, and that's that might be his last Olympics. So I think it's uh, it's, uh, it's we're gonna see the the, the Antoine who's gonna win a, a, an Olympic medal again, hopefully. He's spectacular. Right, I guess to watch. Like, he's so dynamic. Yeah, yeah. Like like you're the generation before you had Nicholas Gill and leading the way, and and, and so uh, Canada's had uh, you know. Good history there. Uh, the uh, I wanted to go back to you, Anthony. We were talking a little bit about wrestling, and I want to talk about you know the, the your WWE shtick, if you will. Like, uh, where, where where tell me about where did Santino Morella come from, and where did uh, uh, the Cobra come from? Tell me about that. Man, about okay. That. Well, I was actually playing a Russian character when I was living in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, it was a character that allowed me to use judo, and uh, but you know, my name, Anthony Corelli, sounds pretty Italian. So one day, Ra was gonna be live from Milan, Italy. And Vince had this idea. He wanted an Italian character, uh, Italian audience member to come out of the crowd and win this championship. It's never been done before. Vince is always big on anything that's never been done before. So uh, they called me up and they said, hey, uh, your background's really Italian, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they go, well, let's just, you know, Vince has this idea. Can you speak Italian? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And yeah. Uh, they they test they tested <laughs> me with a couple of things, and I was able to uh, to deliver and say a few things. When I used to work downtown Toronto, I used to you know rush hour traffic. I had a cassette tape, and the cassette tape was like tourist Italian. I used to just listen to it while I was in traffic all the time, and it paid off because I was able to <laughs> regurgitate and re recall something from that tape, and that was enough to convince the writers that I could speak Italian. And like literally the next day, they gave me my passport back. I flew out the following day, got to Milan, and debuted the next day, and. It was it was crazy, you know. Since since then, <clears throat> I had become a dual citizen. I learned to speak the language better with a uh, Rosetta Stone and a tutor. So kind of you know, life imitated art a little bit. But the Cobra, um, when I was living in Japan in two thousand and four as a professional wrestler, we were out drinking one night after a show. That's kind of customary after a show. You all go to the bar <laughs> and you have drinks together. And there was a guy. His name was Taro. Exactly. And he did. He just showed me this thing he did with his hand where he made it into this little cobra thing and you know asked me to do it and we were just laughing and it was really nothing significant but uh about five years later i was at a live event in uh, i believe atlanta georgia and it just popped into my head and i said you know what i'm going to use this move in my comeback so you know, I'm the comeback, the good guy has the comeback at the end of the match, and I'm going bam, bam, bam. And then I did this Cobra and hit him with it. And the audience immediately laughed. You know, normally they have to be conditioned 
by watching something on television yeah. to know what yeah. it is and to get that response. But they immediately laughed. And um, I did it only on the live events. I never did it on TV yet. And uh, Vince heard about it, wanted to see it. But what you're seeing here on the screen, this is at Battle Arts, where we had, where my old tag team partner, Vladimir Kozlov. Oh, here myself, we go. We ha mm. now, here it comes. Here comes the Cobra. That's my old tag team partner, former world Sambo champion, <clears throat> Vladimir <laughs> Kozlov. <laughs> and we, uh, we flew him down for a little, little reunion match. That's a 300 pound Russian killer right there with the yeah. heart of a teddy bear. That's so, that's so awesome. Like so, I'm, I mean, that much, you know, <laughs> what, what's that all about? Tell us that. That was a little celebration thing I used to yeah, do. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm 220 pounds and he makes me look like a child. Like yeah, he, little, he's, little he's, man. he's a monster. Yeah. Do you still have connections to the WWE? Uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, like WrestleMania 37, which was on last weekend, or? Yeah, you know, you know what? I, I definitely um, was working with the, the performance center before COVID as a commentator. I'm going to go back as a commentator and try and call the action and, and bring it to life. I can have I can do that for another ten years, and um, you know, it's you're you're part of the action. You're you're the way you call the action is a part of the history. You know, um, there have been some incredible matches, and what do you you remember the announcers and the passion and the excitement in their voice? So I want to contribute that way. Now, my daughter is a 25 years old. She's an aspiring professional wrestler. When COVID's over, she'll probably go down to the Performance Center in Orlando and start her career. She's pretty good. She has, you know, she was former Miss Ontario, and she does. Uh, she's an actress and a television host and all that stuff. So she's. She has the it factor that is required, and uh, she's pretty strong and she's pretty big and tall. So she she'll she'll do she'll do really well when her time comes. But when Shadi's done the Olympics, I think then it's going to be mm -hmm. his time in the WWE too. <laughs> I was yeah. going to ask about that. Shadi was MMA I grew, or WWE? I grew up watching WWE from everybody. Like I've seen uh, Anthony beat Umaga for the Intercontinental Championship right away. It was I I loved it. I still watch it. I've watched the I've watched WrestleMania 37 right now, uh, so it was it was a, it was a childhood dream of mine. So if that opportunity comes, I will take I, you down to Triple H no personally. I will, I will take yeah, you down to the Performance Center personally and introduce let's, you. Honestly, hook me up. I I love WWE's been still part of my <laughs> life. Honestly, I have I have over 200 action figures from my kid from being a kid. Now wow. like, I still keep them. Yeah, it's a well, it was a big part of my life. I, was, I used to, yeah, I used to dress up as Jeff Hardy and uh, for Halloween and everything. It was, it was a big deal. Uh, so crazy. if that opportunity ever comes, hundred percent, it will absolutely, it will. And if you get a medal, it's, the door is going to wide, wing open for you. You know, they, they Vince it's, is big on Olympic athletes and Olympic yeah. medalists. Kurt, Kurt Angle two point huh? <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, um, well, bad did, news. Did Brock Lesnar win a medal? medal? Yeah. No, he was the NCAA, NCAA champion. But um, yeah, right. uh, Bad News Brown was an Olympic silver medalist for the United States in uh, the Los Angeles Olympics wow. in heavyweight judo. Wow. That's great. So, I mean, uh, you, you're probably giving this a little bit of thought then, Sh Shadi. Uh, you, have you got a, like a name or a kind of a shtick that, you would, uh, that you've thought about yet? Honestly, I, I don't know the name because that, that Anthony can help me with that. But I I, 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 I love doing the spear. I, I was yeah, I used to always spear my brother spear, okay. Moab out of nowhere. So that, that that'd be my move. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. You know, a star is born. A star is born right here. <laughs> Chadi, how tall are you? Are you six four? I'm six three. Uh, six six four. Just say six four. Six okay, four, yeah. Six four. Six four. Six four. Perfect. Perfect. That's all enough. You're in. I okay. Can't teach height. No, uh, Anthony. <laughs> oh, there we go. There, Anthony. You also returned to the ring a couple of years back. Uh, you made your return to the ring. You did, did a little bit of judo, a little bit of MMA too. Like, tell us about that experience coming back. What was that like? Um, well, so my favorite style of professional wrestling is this MMA style. That that's what I did in Japan. 
where um, here, here's a, I did some judo here too. Here's a little throw. Um, yeah. So um, the, this, this is the style I fell in love with. And um, it, it's realistic. And the thing is, as the, the grappling audience becomes more savvy with regards to what real grappling looks like, this, I believed, was the future of professional wrestling. And it is now to a certain extent. A lot of the guys you see on television are using some more uh, reality-based maneuvers. There's still mm -hmm. the storytelling. And here's, I'm, I'm doing like a guillotine move and he's tapping there. But uh, yeah, so I even competed last year in, in, a, in a, a company called Bloodsport, where it's this style of uh, professional wrestling. And there's no ropes and it's like a, the old kumite thing. Um, if I could do this style of wrestling, I would do it all day. So here I'm not, I'm not being Santino Morella here. I'm being Anthony Corelli. And, uh, right. you know, just this, this to me, it's, it's so exciting. It's, I'm telling you when you're backstage and, and you, it's called a work shoot. A shoot means like real. And this is like a work yeah. real fight. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, yeah. the atmosphere backstage is so different from a professional wrestling match because you're going to go out there and you're going to get banked up. It's really rough. It's a lot rougher than, you know, you can't do this five days a week. This is a, uh, a much tougher style of wrestling. But I wish pro wrestling was more like that. The st that little clip you saw there of, of that realistic looking grappling. Um, yeah, if that was the case, I might dust off the boots a couple times a year. But mm. I'm a commentator now. <laughs> I mean, it looks real. I mean, it, I mean, it looked like you were in some real pain there. I mean, so what? What, what do you think? What's, what? What do you think? It hurt, hurt more in judo in a real judo fight or wrestling? What? What's? What's the? Well, what's the biggest danger? I guess. So judo, you have a lot of small nagging injuries, fingers and toes, and you know, a sore wrist and things that they're not, you know, life changing. And generally, they they heal. When you get hurt in pro wrestling, it's uh, they're, they're big ones, you know, separated shoulders, snapped ankles. That for me, anyway, um, yeah. So they're 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 bigger injuries, and they, you need more time off. Judo, you just need to, <laughs> you go through a lot of tape, you know, a lot so, of yeah. sports tape, yeah, you know, duct tape, and you can get yourself through a, through a practice. You know, if you look at the competitions, the judo athletes, their hands are just so heavily taped because. You're trying to hold on to someone with all your might, and they're trying to rip that gi out of your hands with all their might. Yeah. And all that strength from both guys is just has to go right through the fingertips. And it's, uh, it, that's, I mean, but they're your fingertips, right? You're not gonna right, right. be disabled because you have sore fingers, but you are, I mean, I'm telling you, for years, my, my, my nails were detached from my fingertips for years. And uh, when you take that first shower and the water gets in, it's like, ah, it stings, you know, but yeah. it's not, it's not an injury. It's just a little bit of pain and inconvenience. Right. Yeah. What about you, Shadi? The yeah, fact that you've like... been in a pandemic, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe the injury is cut down a little bit, right? Yeah. hundred percent. And also I feel like in judo, the rules uh, are, the, the, the rules switch a lot. So it became a lot safer. For us there's no leg grabs and like a lot of stuff like a flying arm bar became uh, automatic disqualification whereas in wrestling it's an entertainment business right so you need the big dangerous throws and stuff because that's what people like to watch so for us yeah judo like yeah my like i have i have a fractured uh, elbow but i can still compete and i'll do the surgery after the olympics but for as mm -hmm. uh yeah, for uh, for uh, WWE and like any entertainment uh, wrestling business, it's like if we take Jeff Hardy for example, like I wouldn't lie, like no way nobody could do what he does if like a judoka would not be able to handle that pain like like that. I feel like you know it's a uh, it's a different risk. Yeah, so I'm happy with judo because it's uh, the rules are good now. There's no leg grabs, and I hated that, so it became safer for me too. So. <laughs> yeah, it's a different. It's a different. It's a different world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been awesome, you guys. I appreciate you, you being on the program today. This is. I, I've learned a lot. I want to ask you before we go. Uh, uh, Anthony, is is your daughter got a got a name yet? A stage name that she's working on, or anything like that, or what? what who, who are we looking well, for in, in the future? She she would probably want to capitalize. Uh, her real name is Bianca. 
Bianca Sofia Corelli, but she's probably going to capitalize on being Santino Morella's daughter. Uh, but uh, there's a girl right now called B Bianca Belair. That's that's not my daughter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I remember. Vic, that. that's not her daughter. That's not his daughter. Yeah, that that's Who is another that? story. That that's my sister. <laughs> that's you. No, it's your sister. Okay, that's yeah, me. Right. <laughs> me dressed. It was me, but it was, the character was my sister. I okay, that. nice. But uh, so she's going by Sophia Morella right now. I mean, she's gonna have to get okay. the 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 green light to use Morella because that's you know trademarked and stuff. But if she does right. get there, it'll be Sophia Morella. Yeah. And tell us about your gym, Battle Arts. I mean, that, I guess if, if you want to be a, a wrestler, any 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 combat sport at all, uh, Battle Arts Academy is a place to go. Tell us a little bit about your gym. Yeah, we opened up in 2013 in Mississauga. And so when I was in Japan in 2004, the MMA fighters and the pro wrestlers trained together. And in fact, some of the pro wrestlers would do MMA fights and some of the MMA fighters would do pro wrestling shows. And I just loved that concept. Uh, here's me <laughs> coaching judo, doing a rhythm drill. And uh, so anyway, we do boxing, MMA, judo, jujitsu, uh, Olympic wrestling, and of course, professional wrestling. So it's really, a, and strength and conditioning. So it's a one-stop shop. Well, it's been, you know, basically closed for the last year. Uh, we're yeah. just chomping at the bit to, to open up again and uh, continue doing what we love to do and, and train kids and polish athletes. And, and uh, our professional wrestling program is, is, is the, the real big bread and butter program there. You know, we have 40, 50 aspiring professional wrestlers at any time. And the gym actually transforms. I designed it, my masterpiece, to uh, mm -hmm. transform into an arena. So like the, the, the mats roll up, the curtains slide out, we put chairs and we have a, a ring there with bleachers. So we actually are able to give um, our professional wrestling students uh, experience performing in front of a live crowd. And that's the most valuable piece of their education is performing in front of a live audience and getting that feedback from the audience. Right. So. Uh, it's an incredible, it's like a mini performance center. You know, WWE has the performance center down in Orlando and it's like a mini, miniature version of the performance center. And the, and the quality of the education is is on par with what you're getting at the performance center. I just don't have the uh, authority to hire anybody, but uh, when, right. when, when they get a look at my students, there's always positive feedback in the curriculum and the education. So I feel good that I'm, I'm giving them something valuable and, and applicable. Wow, but soon we'll be open like, up. Yeah, soon, yeah. yeah, soon July, July, uh, August, September. You know, when the vaccines get out enough, hopefully we'll we'll get to that place where we can open up and have a have everything everything hopping again. But look, great place, and it looks awesome. And uh, and good luck, to, good luck uh, to you with it with the adventure, uh, Shadi. I want to say good luck in Tokyo. We'll we'll be watching you. All the viewers today yes. I know are going to be looking out for you, and uh, you know, go get them, man. Yeah, you, you can do it, and, Thank and, you so and, much. and I think you, you, you're and you're going to make us proud. You know it, and we're behind you all the way. Thank Thanks for so being much. on the program today. Yes, and and Thank as guests on uh, Joe Tilly Sports, well, my pleasure, my pleasure. As guests on Joe Tilly Sports, we have a club link for some for you, so you guys will have to get a chance to hit the links at, at some point. Oh yeah, before we go, I want to say I I know I, I understand you're a big big hoops fan. Are, are you a Raptors fan? Or uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I, I, I'm a Raptors fan, but I'm more of a Lakers fan, to be honest. Yeah, Lakers fan? <laughs> yeah okay. I was gonna yeah, say, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's yeah, documented yeah. pictures of him wearing Lakers jerseys. <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. So it's it been because it's been a little disappointing what's happened to the Raptors, but Lakers are fine. Yeah. They're the defending champs. And what what got you hooked on the Lakers? Uh, on, I grew up watching Kobe, of course, and everything, and. Uh, yeah, I, when Lonzo and Kuzma first went there, I was like, "Oh, like I like these dudes," even though they're like so so now. But yeah, it was it was that's right. that's where it started. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, well, good luck. Good luck to your Lakers, but better luck to the Raptors. I mean, they need a lot of luck. <laughs> yeah. right now. Uh, you know, once again, yeah, you you got, you got a club link for some for you. And uh, thanks again for being on the show. When we come back, we've got uh, we're going to hear from Nick Foligno. And uh, remember, folks, we're all in it together. Good luck. Thanks, guys. Promotional consideration provided by Clublink. Clublink. One membership, more golf.
do you realize that 80% of golfers enjoy country music? Really? No, but 100% of golfers enjoy timely play. And that means being ready when it's your turn. Bring enough clubs to make a shot when you go to a ball that's away from your bag. Leave your clubs in an advanced position so when you move on, you're not going backwards. Remember, we're all in this together. Are you kidding me? Addiction Rehab Toronto, Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center, saving lives, reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life. Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 1-855-787-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. Joe Tilly Sports is brought to you by COSA. Central Ontario Standard Bread Association, providing a united voice for harness horse people racing at Ontario tracks. Check out your benefits today at COSAonline.com and check out COSA TV on Facebook and YouTube for all the latest harness news and live action updates. Live racing year-round. Go to hpibet.com for all your wagering options. Become a member today and your first bet is free. That's hpibet.com. Well, just in case you were wondering at the least, we're really serious about taking a run for the cup. Well, here you go. The Buds scooped up one of the most absolute tops in character, leadership, and grit. Nick Felino from Columbus. Felino, who's Mike, uh, whose dad Mike also played for the Buds, joins the club for the stretch run. The 33-year-old who was the coach captain is about to become an unrestricted free agent in the offseason. It costs at least a first-round pick. I know it sounds like a lot, but this guy is the real deal. He's going to wear the number 71, which his father wore right here in Teal. Well, I just, you know, I'm playing them last year uh, in, in, you know, in the bubble and just seeing the team and, then, you know, the, how young they were, but also just how dangerous they were. And I felt like they were a team that learned a lot about themselves and, um, and I just felt like it was a fit for me in the sense of just what I can bring and, and help. And, uh, you know, I know, I know Jason Spezza, who's a guy that's, you know, paid his dues and long time, uh, looking for a cup and just, everything just felt right. You know, just you, sometimes I'm a, I'm a guy that plays off my gut, my heart. And, uh, you know, my heart was telling me this was the right move. So I went with it and, you know, I can tell even from when I said, you know, that this is something I wanted to do. Uh, it just, just felt right. So I'm looking forward to, to that opportunity. And, you know, obviously being around the guys, there's a, there's a little bit of a lull here uh, with the, the seven days that's coming. But uh, I'm really looking forward to just, just getting there and getting acquainted with everything and then hitting the ground running and helping any way I can. I just remember the passion of the fans. And I remember the, how excited my dad was. And I remember, I think it was after beating St. Louis, he actually, we got to walk the streets home and the parade atmosphere that the fans kind of gave and, you know, that just stuck with me since, you know, to this day, um, how passionate Leaf fans are. You know, I know it. I, I live in, in the summer in Sudbury, Ontario. It's split down the middle, you know, 50, 50 Habs fans, Leaf fans. And um, so I know, I know what it's like and, 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 you know, the, the reach that the team has and, uh, and I'll never forget that run. I mean, it's something my dad talks about to this day and it's, it's, you know, kind of ingrained into that city and people still talk about it to this day. So I'm looking forward to, to going on another one, you know, being the next Felino to do so and, uh, and joining a great team that has already, you know, done a lot of work to get in a, in a position to be talked about in that way. And I'm, I'm excited about joining and helping that team. And, and you know, not, you know, I also don't really believe in pressure. I think it's just an opportunity. So I'm, I'm excited about the opportunity that I have to, to join a team that, is put, that has put themselves in a position to be talked about in, in, in that light as a team that can, that can do some damage in the playoffs. And, uh, you know, there's still a long time from now till then, but, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to joining that. Well, I just think their maturity, you know, you can just see their, their attention to detail and, and how, you know, they, they've obviously got just such great firepower up front, but even the games they do win, they just seem to, 
to hunker down or find ways to win games. And I think that's always what I said is the sign of, of good teams in this league is you find a way to win. And they just seem to do that. They just seem to, to it's got to be a defensive effort. They, they seem to be putting in the work in that regard. They got to score more goals. They have the ability to do that. And they've obviously gotten great goaltending of late. So, um, you know, they just have a mix of being able to win a lot of different ways. And uh, that's a dangerous thing. If you can get confident in doing that come playoff time when it tightens up and you have that confidence of being able to win different ways, uh, it, it, it really bodes well in the playoffs. Yes, and the Leafs also acquired goaltending insurance. They got David Riddick uh, flames, uh, from the Flames for a third-round pick. Riddick, uh, pretty good in his, in his Leafs debut. Uh, they also scooped forward Ante Suomela from the Sharks in exchange for Alexander Barabanov. Uh, they grabbed defenseman Ben Hutton from the Ducks for a fifth-round draft uh, pick. They at least also signed Rodion Amarov today to a three-year deal, an entry-level contract, the Bud's first-round pick from last year's draft, 15th overall. Amarov is 19. He skated in 39 games for Salabat Yuleyev of the KHL this past season, recording nine goals, four assists. He is ranked third among under-20 skaters in the K. Well, the shorthanded Raptors are going about the business of beating – teams occasionally uh will they squeak into a play-in or will they look at the draft lottery uh, time will tell i guess uh, devastating news for the denver nuggets and team canada jamal murray the pride of kitchener is gone for the season and then some after suffering a torn mcl murray was having a career year with the nuggets and they're sitting fourth in the west poised to make a serious playoff run not anymore with the more on the canadian hoops uh, scene here's keegan levine Thanks, Joe. Keegan Levine here. Welcome to another segment of Canadian Hoop and Scoop, talking all things Canadian basketball and some tough news for Denver Nugget fans and Canada basketball fans as Jamal Murray out indefinitely for the remainder of the NBA season. He suffered a torn ACL in last night's loss to the Golden State Warriors, and this is a big blow for both the Nuggets and Team Canada basketball. Canada looking ahead at that Olympic qualifying tournament. And it's going to be a little tougher now without Jamal Murray on that yes. roster. But one guy they hope they can count on to play and represent the country is Shea Gilgis Alexander. He's been tearing it up this season, setting a career high scoring average. The Toronto native has turned into the main offensive initiator and the focal point of that young Thunder offense. Shea is well on his way to becoming an NBA superstar. And let's take a look at his basketball journey to the NBA. SGA trying to size up Russell. Oh, what a nifty move. SGA got it up. He's a good and he banked it in. At the buzzer. The road to the NBA for Shea Gilgis Alexander has been one of highs and lows. Shea grew up in Toronto, Ontario and comes from an athletic family. His mother, Charmaine Gilgis, competed in track at the 1992 Summer Olympics for Antigua and Barbuda. His cousin, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, was drafted to the NBA a year after Shea. But within his family of basketball players comes competitiveness. Uh, so just growing up really was, it was a very like, competitive household. With, like me, my brother, his little brother, him, and then playing on like the same club team, same AAU team. This has been competitive. Shaquille, Shea, and Nikhil played pickup basketball with each other frequently, and that's what Shaq thinks helped mold Shea into the player he is today. Like, I feel like we're his biggest critics. So like, we don't tell him what he what he wants to hear. So like we'll be like, yeah, like you're not that good. And my brother would say the same thing to him. Like, nah, you 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 we thought you were better than this. You're not that good. So I think that's what it is. It's like we. We help him, we motivate him to be a better basketball player. That was just a little glimpse into Shea's basketball beginning, folks. And it was great to hear from his cousin Shaq, whom I went to Conestoga College with in Kitchener. He was fourth in the OCAA in scoring when I was there. So the basketball talent just runs in the family. Tune in next week as we look at Shea's journey from Kentucky to the NBA draft and to where he is now. This has been Canadian Hoop and Scoop. For Joe Tilly Sports, I'm Keegan Levine. All right, thanks, Keegan. Well, he's a Jay staff ace, and he's certainly been looking the part. Yunjin Ryu uh, mowed down the Yankees in his last start. He's throwing harder with more control than last season when he was third in the Cy Young voting, so that's pretty good for the Blue Jays. Rowdy Tellez is finally getting his bat going, and Vlad Guerrero has been 
just terrific, as is as has been Bo Bichette. Jays will contend for a wild card spot this year. Toronto FC has made it through to the quarterfinals of the CONCACAF Champions League thanks to a 2-1 win over Lyon of Mexico. The Reds opens, uh, open regular season play against Montreal this weekend. Justin Morrow and Patrick Mullen scored, and Alex Bono was solid in goal for TFC, who won that second game 2-1 to win 3-2 on aggregate. Well, it was a fun ride for Hideki Matsuyama at Augusta. He's, he put on a clinic in round three, and then he hung on by one shot for his first major, first by a Japanese male. Xander Shoffley could have pulled it off if it weren't for that one lousy tee shot on 16. Yeah, did feel good for Matsuyama, though, and a, a great tournament for uh, Will Zelatoris, who we're going to hear more from again. Corey Connors, a Canadian, was a solid eight, so he earns a spot back in next, next year's field. By the way, uh, Humble Howard won the Expert Challenge, so he's taking Rod Black and I to Glenn Karen, and Rod and I will pick up dinner. Join us May 12th when we preview the PGA Championship. Don't want to miss that. Okay. Our weekly contest, the Chotilly Sports Contest, is heating up. We're giving away 12 awesome Mitch Marner t-shirts and three collector sports prints from the talented artist Rob McDougall. You can enjoy all of Rob's work at robmcdougall.com. To enter, simply subscribe to Joe Tilly on YouTube. It's easy and it's free. One t-shirt or print will be handed out each week. We'll notify the winners on the show and we'll call out their names. Good luck to you all. And this week's winner is... Carson Graham of Port Perry. Congratulations, Carson. Keep her lit, as Carson would say. Okay, we close with the folks who, who make this show possible. These are friends, trusted business associates, and all-around great folks. We highly recommend them all. A reminder that Joe Tilly Sports is also available on the Spanglish Network, uh, Zingo TV, and the Fired Up Network. Thanks once again to Shadi El Nahas and Anthony Corelli. Great to have you guys on the show, and thank you for watching. We'll see you next week when we welcome the CFTO sports team. That's right. Lance, Sunil, and Claude will be on the show. We'll see you then. Get Aldo at REMAX Crossroads. Do you want to buy or sell a home? Could 31 years of real estate experience help you? Why not speak to an amazing team that loves to overpromise and overdeliver? Call 416-GET-ALDO or visit www.getaldo.com to find out what next level real estate looks like. RS Demolition and Excavation has extensive experience with complete teardowns and interior strip outs. Looking to build a custom home? RS Excavating Services has the experience you need to build in established neighborhoods. For the highest level of quality and cost efficient results, we provide innovative demolition solutions completed on time and on budget while ensuring our number one priority, safety. Call 647-852-3006 for an estimate or visit rsdemolition.ca. Brian Gribben Insurance Planning, helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in their early years of retirement without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. Let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family and your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did 905-686-5678. Gold Line Resources, discovering high-grade gold in Sweden. Gold Line Resources owns a prospective portfolio of four high-grade gold exploration projects located on the Gold Line Mineral Belt of North Central Sweden and one gold exploration project in the Skelftia Belt of North Central Sweden. For more information on how you can invest in this new initiative, go to goldlineresources.com or call one 800 858 9710. Gold Line Resources can also be found on the TSX Ventures Exchange as GLDL. Looking for an advantage in choosing your investment options? Belmont Venture Capital will provide you with the best up to date opportunities in the mid cap and junior sector. The company was formed 12 and a half years ago and is spearheaded by two seasoned veterans of the financial markets with over 80 years combined experience. Go to BelmontVentureCapital.com today for the latest hot picks on the market. And don't forget to sign up for the newsletter. BelmontVentureCapital.com oh,